So in this case, you have an Egyptian government that was incredibly comfortable uh, with, its, with its political circumstances in such a way so as to allow for com- you know, relative openness. And they also had encouraged uh, people to go online as, as often as possible across various socioeconomic classes and groups. So they, they had provided their government servers uh, for, uh, for dial- I mean, of course, dial-up is incredibly weak and slow, but nevertheless, if you had the equipment and resources necessary, you could go online and you could, you could surf the net and you could join Facebook groups. So they were trying to egalitarianize the Internet as much as possible and make it accessible uh, w- with no real fear. You know, so long as they were keeping up with what's happening, they could identify uh, any sort of major spikes in certain areas. But uh, and of course, you know, that became evident in the case of Wa'il Ghanim. Uh, they, you know, one person that they really pursued and couldn't get information on was the administrator of the We're, we're All Khalid Saeed page. So the fact that the, that was able to fly under the radar uh, may have been the reason why it it was as salient as it was. But uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I think uh, the Egyptian government may have actually dug its own grave by allowing the cyber media to be as open and, and of course, made uh, the shutting down of the Internet seem all the more drastic right. on, on Thursday, January 27th. And it wasn't just that. It was combined with mobile technology. So all of a sudden, people who had become so reliant on using mobile phones and had, you know, all of a sudden, landlines had become obsolete, as is the case here in North America. They couldn't even contact their families. So this was incredibly ominous for a regime that was either uh, very desperate and I think was a last straw for those individuals who were really the fence those who weren't following the Facebook uh, situation uh, but had seen that their government was prepared to go to such, uh, to such an extreme uh, measure to be able to control information. Uh, and that, I think, was, uh, was the first major uh, blow to the discourse of, of the Egyptian state. Thank you. Uh, questions? Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you, guys. Um, I actually have a question for Adel. Um, Listening to you talk about the um, sort of questioning whether the online activists are able to take their power offline and whether they're able to reach some of the more remote communities, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. I mean, how different are they from previous generations uh, of the tiny minority elites who brought to the Arab world ideas such as Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment from Europe when they went studying there? How are they any different from those who brought the printing press and started printing newspapers and propagating ideas such as nationalism and the nation state. They were also minorities, uh, but ultimately their ideas did end up taking hold and they were able to reach the most unreachable, as you called them. So how do you put, them, how do you put the cyber activists within a larger historic, historical context for the Arab world specifically? Okay, this, uh, it's a great question. I think to a great extent uh, it's not a difference in, in approach but a difference in means. Uh, so we're talking about different capacities. So yes, um, if, if one were to rely on the distribution of pamphlet, pamphlets uh, and newspapers and publications in the post-Ottoman Empire uh, or the, the emergence of uh, a voice of the Arabs as uh, an impetus for creating a nationalist discourse uh, in Egypt and across the region, uh, media plays an absolutely huge role in all of this. Um, in the case of the cyber activists and cyber dissidents, their disadvantage is actually the digital divide more so than anything else. So if they can take their message to uh, communication systems and, and, and avenues and channels that are accessible to a larger swath of the population, then they can, they can probably uh, accomplish this. The other problem that they also face is a, is a literacy problem uh, that uh, you, they need to be able to uh, communicate using uh, a, a language, using a rhetoric, using narratives that are convincing and resonant. Uh, with the majority of the population. Um, and, of course, among most elites, there's a tendency to believe... That there is sort of an element of, of condescension as well. So um, they have to begin to listen to what's happening on the ground. They need to communicate with the people in Asyut, in Port Said, uh, in Aswan, in Suez, in, in various parts of the country, in, in Marsa Matruh, in the far-flung parts of, of, of the nation uh, to understand how to create sort of a nationalist discourse. Um, and, of course, they have to also contend with with uh, a major shift in the dynamics of government, uh, and that is the fact that you you know people power does mean something now. You know that it's not about a nationalist project or or sort of a a, a statist project that's created from the central sort of uh, power 
you know, uh, power areas, the headquarters that is either Cairo or Damascus or whatever. Now they have to listen to uh, the Suezes. I mean, Suez played an absolutely enormous role uh, in the Egyptian revolution and is usually forgotten uh, because Tahrir Square stole the limelight. But uh, but that's, I think, one of the key factors is to is to allow the these you know, far-flung areas to communicate for themselves and for the cyber activists to listen and to also uh, egalitarianize their message by crossing the digital divide and use mechanisms that they may not actually be accustomed to. You know, how do you go from being Wa'il Ghanim, the cyber activist who, who types his message into a Facebook status, to actually uh, speaking to folks in, in Mahalla? You know, uh, on the streets of Mahalla, who know nothing about the internet, who have never touched a keyboard before. What about the folks in Tahrir Square that came out to protest? And when they were told that this was a Facebook revolution, they said, "Well, what's Facebook? What's this revolution that I'm trying to support?" So I think uh, it's a, it's a shift in means, it's a shift, shift in mechanism, and also a shift in in, in rhetoric. And I would just add to that that we can't forget the key role that the more traditional media is going to play. And I think mm-hmm. they're, they are the key at trying to bridge that digital divide. So we saw, for example, in 2005, there was an Al Jazeera documentary about bloggers in Egypt that really helped educate a slightly broader public about what was happening. You had the introduction of a blog page into Al Masri Al Yom. You had greater coverage, for example, in Al Aham about bloggers and you start they start using them as sources their issues become stories and certainly with the dominant narrative of social media's role in the revolution i think that that's going to help bridge that digital divide and it's going to help broaden their message I want to add one one more thing. Um, it, I think we're actually starting to witness that in, a, in, an, in an interesting way. For instance, Egyptian private satellite stations are playing a huge role in sort of narrativizing the revolution. Mm-hmm. You know, the revolution is now something very, very uh, palpable. Um, it's it's also seen with some level of, of positivity that it's a good thing. It's a source of immense pride. Uh, stations like Dream or Mehwar uh, and also OTV or On TV, uh, which are un, you know owned by uh, Nagib Sawiris the Egyptian you know, entrepreneur, uh, those are incredibly important parts of, of how the revolution has unfolded and are helping sort of uh, create those resonant messages. And many of the cyber activists are actually appearing on mm-hmm. a regular basis on those stations. So they're, they're becoming more and more iconic and more recognizable. But of course, it puts them uh, under some scrutiny. And you know, we're talking about individuals who uh, may be incredibly good organizers, but uh, are not necessarily polemicists or, or pundits, you know, uh, and may not have sort of the charisma necessary to compel a, a, a nation to kind of rise and support a revolution. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. Absolutely. And, and of course, immediate system that hasn't opened up mm-hmm. in such a way. That the Egyptian system, everything is on the table now. Nobody knows where state media in Egypt is going to go. Right. So, I mean, it may so become very pro revolutionary. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. We have a question from uh, Bloomberg News. Um, I think it's directed toward Courtney, but Adel, I'm sure you'll have a lot to say on this as well. What should the U.S. government do or not do to help cyber activists promote democratic change and the so called Arab awakening going forward? Can mobile activism tip the scales in Syria, Jordan, Bahrain, or elsewhere? Could comment on the U.S. role in backing and funding this. Um, I mean, I mean, I think the U.S. has to be very careful in what role it takes. Um, I think that funding basic civic activism and training and political mobilization um, it is one approach. I think in Egypt, for example, uh, in 2004, 2005, um, you saw a lot of funding for that type of work. And there were a lot. Of, there was a lot of interest in in funding um, organization until basically Hamas won, and then there was kind of they pulled back and said, "Wait a minute, what happens when you get democracy in the Arab world?" And I think that question is definitely hanging over the head of the um, U.S. administration as it thinks about how to engage in different parts of the world. But I think that's definitely what is key for the U.S. government is to keep up its support for basic. Um, fundamental human rights, political rights, and civil liberties. They have to protect that no matter who's trying to exert them, whether it's the Muslim Brotherhood um, or it's the, you know, liberal cyber activists, communists. Um, you, you, they have to rhetorically and financially support that. They also have to continue, I think, to put money where their mouth is on internet freedom and mobile freedom. Um, that's obviously been a key talking point for Clinton over the past few years, and there are some um, initiatives out to provide funding for that. 